This is a church with problems. I'm not talking about the Royal Oak Corps, although it too may have problems. I'm talking about that group of Christian believers who lived in the city of Corinth. You know about that church. The Apostle Paul wrote two letters to it to help the believers who lived in that ancient city, a large city known for its immoral living. In fact, as we read those letters that Paul wrote, especially the first one, we get the idea that those inside the church may have been as immoral and ungodly as those who lived outside the church. If you've not read 1 Corinthians, you should. It will open your eyes and may cause you to ask yourself whether these Christians were really Christians at all. You'll read of believers who formed into groups like political parties within the church opposing each other. Paul tells us there was confusion and disorder when they met for worship. One member in the church was taking another to court. One man was living with his stepmother as husband and wife. A situation so terrible that Paul says not even unbelievers, not even pagans live that way. When they meet, when they met for the common meal, well, it was chaotic, sort of like family night supper. But it's the very same people that Paul addresses as God's holy people. In fact, they were called to be God's holy people, Paul tells us. Just as there are callings in our day, callings to be teachers or farmers or shopkeepers, nurses, ministers, even Salvation Army officers, those Christians in Corinth were called to be holy people. They were called to be saints. Further, given all the problems that existed in the church there, Paul could almost be said to be telling them, you have call, been called to be saints. You have been called to be holy people. Now start acting like it. Start living the way God intends his people to live. Start being the people God intends his people to be. Start living like what he wants you to be. Perhaps God may be saying, even saying that to us this morning here in this place. Start living like the people I created you to be. Start living like holy people. Start living holy lives. Well, what does it mean to be holy? Many people, even many Christians, become a little hesitant and uneasy when this word is used, especially in talking about themselves. Which of us, after all, could ever be described as holy? Put your hands up. Not a one in this place. Hmm. Which of us could ever be described as a saint? Is that how we describe ourselves? In the Bible, especially the Old Testament, holy was often used to describe things which belonged to God, things which were used in the service of God, for example, in the temple. So items such as special clothing, Pots for water, vessels, food were called holy when used as part of worship because those things belonged entirely to God. They were used in the service of God. They were set apart for him. They were holy. 
Their only use was to honor God. They had no other purpose, no other reason for existing. The Sabbath was holy because it belonged to God. They existed for God's use and nothing else. They were called holy, these people, because they belonged to God. In the New Testament, the word came to be applied also to people, not just things, but applied to people who belonged entirely to God. God whose purpose in life was, though people whose purpose in life was to serve and please God, those who belonged to God were called saints. So Peter writes to Christians in 1 Peter and says they are the chosen people, the holy nation, God's own people. They were called out of darkness into marvelous light. At one time they were not God's people, but now they are his people. At one time they did not know God's mercy, but now they have received his mercy. This happened not because of anything they had done or anything they had or because of who they were, but because of what God had done in them and for them in Christ by his spirit. They were God's people. They were a holy people. They became saints the moment they confessed faith in Christ and became a member of God's family. From that time, they were marked as the people of God, belonging to him and not belonging to themselves. Saints are not perfect, as we might understand perfection, but perfect because they are doing and being what was intended them for them to do and to be. They were intended to be holy people set apart for God and his purposes. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. And you are God's people. You are a holy people. You, and you, and you are called to be holy people. You are God's people. You are a holy people because of what God in Christ Jesus has done for you. Now, if I were sitting in the audience, I'd say amen to that. Thank you. Sorry to have to prompt you like that, but I need encouragement. So start acting like it. Start living like what you are called to be. Start living like what you are. You are the people of God. You and you and you. You are the people of God. So, how do holy people live? Let's begin by how they do not live. Paul says, this is how those who are not led by the Spirit of God live. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft, People become enemies and they fight. They become jealous and angry and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious. They get drunk. They have orgies and do other things like these. Galatians chapter 5. There is nothing attractive about that kind of life. We would not want our children to be around people like that. We don't want to be around people like that. And we ourselves do not want to be like that. Paul says, those kinds of people will never possess the kingdom of God. 
But here is how those who are the people of God live. The Spirit of God in them, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, produces love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and humility and self-control. That is what holy people look like. That is what holy people are. People who belong completely to God live like that. It says to me that a Christian's life is an attractive and pleasant thing. Now those kinds of people we like to be with. We would let our children play with people like that. We know some Christian people, probably not here in this place, but we know some Christian people who are difficult to be with. Is there anybody here who is difficult to be with? Uh, one hand, two hands, three hands. Uh, well, it's the minority. It's the minority. But we know some Christian people who are difficult to be with, who are not very pleasant, who are always angry, always complaining about something. Perhaps you know people like that. That is not the life God intended for us. The person who belongs entirely to God does not let the world determine how he lives. Let me say that again. It's worth repeating even if I did write it. The person who belongs to God does not let the world determine how he lives, but God alone. One is less concerned with what the world thinks of us, more concerned with what God thinks of us. I heard a person say once, if you feel good after doing something that is right, if you feel bad, probably should have said badly, I think that's better English. If you feel badly after doing it, then it is wrong. That is how the world thinks and lives. That may be how the world thinks. That may be popular philosophy and practice, but it is not how the Christian thinks or lives. The one who belongs entirely to God only wants to do one thing, what God wants, what pleases him. Our heart, our mind, our will are all directed to God, all directed by God, and only God. So how does this life come to be? This kind of life does not come easily, may not come easily for any of us. It may not happen all at once. It requires faith that God, by his spirit, will accomplish it in our lives. It requires discipline. That is, if we are given a choice, we will always choose what God wants us to do. It's a matter of the will we will choose to do the right thing, the Christian thing, the godly thing. Reminding ourselves that God does not make us do what we do not want to do. This kind of life begins with a decision on our part, saying to God, I want to live for you. I want to live completely for you and only for you. And by the grace and strength your spirit gives me, I will. Not doing, but being. Being comes before the doing. It's a life lived only by the spirit. This is not human effort, but only by relying on the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, can we be the saints, the holy people God calls us to be. 
This is not a case of not being able to sin. As long as we are in these mortal bodies, we will be able to sin, but rather being able not to sin by the Spirit of God, by trusting him, by belonging entirely to God. God's Spirit is here. The gift of Pentecost, the promise of God has come, and we can be the people God wants us to be. The question is, is not. The question is not how great is our sin, how great is our weakness, how many times have we failed. Rather, the question is, how great is our God? And God is great enough to make us what he wants us to be. Amen. Amen. And he wants to make us holy. He wants us to be his people dedicated completely to him, belonging entirely to him for his purposes and for him to use. He wants us to represent him as light in a dark and desperate world, a world filled with sin and confusion, hatred and evil. He wants us to live like the people he has called us to be. In the great churches, the great cathedrals of the world, one of the things we notice immediately when we enter are the stained glass windows windows which allow the sunlight outside to come inside into the church. The windows line the walls of the church and often contain scenes from the Bible or pictures of the great women and, and men of God, those whom we call saints. A young child seeing such a window with the sun coming through for the first time remarked that a saint is one whom the light shines through. Hmm. Let me suggest that a saint on earth is one whom the light of God shines through. The light of God shines through the holy people of God. And you are the people of God. And you have been called to be saints. And you are a saint by calling. Now start living like what you are called to be. Live like what you are. Allow the light of God to shine through you to a dark world. Be a saint. Be what God has called you to be and do what God has called you to do. This is the will of God, even our sanctification. Amen. The Course says, all that I am, all I can be, all that I have, all that is me, accept and use, at Lord, as you would choose, Lord, right now, today. Take every passion, every skill, take all my dreams and bend them to your will. My all I give, Lord, for you I'll live, Lord. Come with me. And there may be some in the meeting this morning who are here for whom these words have been especially helpful and useful. And now was an opportunity to respond to what you've heard, what you have felt, and what you have seen. The Spirit of God is here, speaking, helping, being with us, enabling us to be all that he wants and calls us to be. 
all that I am. That's what the Lord wants to hear from us, is us saying to him, all that I am, all I can be, belongs to you, Lord. And it may be helpful to come to this place of prayer, there's nothing magical or mystical about coming to this place. But when people come in faith, believing and reaching out to God, God hears prayers and answers them and provides the help that we need. What do you need God to do in your life this morning? Well, you know, If he is speaking to you by his spirit, listen to his voice. And I invite you to come as an act of worship, as an act of prayer, as an act of desire to truly be the people of God. Sing with me, please. And even as we sing, I invite you to come to this place. God helps those who come to him and he will help you this morning. Sing with me, please.